Hello, everybody. I'm Christine Diekman. I'm a professor in the Department of Art, Media, and Design at Cal State San Marcos, where I teach film, video, and sound studies. I'm also a professor of Introduction to Sound Studies, which is one of the courses that are that's hosting our series tonight, Resounding Visions. And I'm here with my colleague, Professor Diaz. Hello, everyone. My name is Misael Diaz. I'm an assistant professor of art, media, and design at Cal State San Marcos as well, and the instructor of AMD 368 Art of World Cultures, which is the other course that we'll be hosting uh, and has been hosting the Resounding Visions uh, speaker series this semester. Uh, Professor Diekman and I wanted to begin today's presentation with the land acknowledgement. Uh, we would like to acknowledge that we are speaking to you tonight from the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay peoples and that the meeting place of CSUSM and its surrounding areas is still home to the six federally recognized bands of the La Jolla, Paula, Pama, Pechanga, Rincon, Soboba, Luceño, Payam, Kawichan people. We would like to take this moment to acknowledge and express our appreciation and respect for those groups whose homelands we reside and learn on, recognizing that they are stewards of this land from time immemorial, in spite of the ongoing violence of settler colonialism. Given that we're not all together for the session, we invite you to take a look into whose ancestral homelands you reside on by consulting the resources uh, that we will be sharing in the chat shortly, uh, recognizing that this is a first step in honoring the resilience and strength of indigenous communities and expressing solidarity with efforts to undo their intentional erasure. Thank you, Musial, for that very important and beautiful acknowledgement. Let's just all take a few moments to absorb this acknowledgement in resilience, strength, and solidarity. So welcome, welcome again to Resounding Visions. This is a year long series of BIPOC artists, musicians, and scholars who work at the intersection of sound and art to explore forms of cultural resistance and affirmation. The programming committee for this series includes faculty members, Musial Diaz, who is obviously here with us, Myself, Anna Luisa Petrisco, and Jeff Ray. I'd like to extend a very special thank you to Steve and Laura Wagner and the Epstein Family Foundation for their generous funding that makes these events possible. And we also want to thank the School of Arts staff for their support, including Albert Rascon and Kevin Coleman. All the presentations are online via Zoom with a link provided before the presentation as you came on tonight. Events are Thursday evenings at 5.30 Pacific Standard Time, and we urge you to stay informed by following us on Instagram, which I will type again in our chat. There you go. Professor Diaz will offer more information about our series and introduce our presenter for tonight. Thank you. Yeah, so before I introduce today's guest speaker, I wanted to let you all know that in lieu of using the chat uh, to share questions and or comments with our presenter, uh, we please ask that you use the Q&A function. Uh, we're going to be closing down the chat shortly. So again, if you have questions or comments uh, that you'd like for us to share with the presenter, please type it into the Q&A for uh, us to address. Uh, today's presentation uh, by Amelia Winger Bearskin will last approximately 45 minutes or so. Uh, and afterwards, we will be opening it up for questions and comments. Uh, and Professor Diekman and I will be reading out loud uh, the, com the comments and the questions for our presenter to respond to. Uh, so now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Amelia Winger Bearskin. Amelia Winger Bearskin is an artist, technologist, and community builder who seeks to empower and leverage uh, to empower communities by leveraging bleeding edge technology uh, to affect positive change in the world. Her work in immersive media, such as VR, performance, and participatory events, explores the relationship between systems and storytelling, inviting audiences to reflect on the social and emotional dimensions of life in a tech-saturated society. Winger Breskin has presented her work at a variety of venues, nationally and internationally, including the 2019 Summit on Fostering Universal Ethics and Compassion at His Holiness Dalai Lama's World Headquarters in Dar Masala, the New Museum, uh, the Newark Museum, and Arizona State University. And her art is also part of the permanent collections of the Guggenheim Museum and the McCord Museum. She's a senior technical training specialist at Contentful in the San Francisco Bay Area, and she founded Idea New Rochelle, which partnered with the New, Ro New Rochelle Mayor's Office to develop a citizen-focused VR-AR tool 
uh, that was awarded the 2018 Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge, a $1 million grant uh, to prototype their, their AR citizen toolkit. She's a Google VR Jumpstart creator, uh, co-directing with Wendy Redstar, a 360 video story about Native American monsters, which was selected for MacArthur grants through the Sundance Institute Native New Frontiers Story Lab in 2018. She's also the co-founder of the Stupid Hackathon, which now holds events around the world, and is also the founder and host of Wampum.Code's podcast, uh, and the host of Contentful Algolia's developer podcast, Dream Stacks. We are so excited to have her joining us, so please welcome Amelia Winger Bearskin. Thank you so much for that generous introduction and for inviting me here. It's so wonderful to be a part of your community. Thank you so much. Um, all right. Well, I try to, to live uh, <laughs> my presentation life by the practice of art that I do as well by having a lot of video and uh, humor in there. So um, please let me know if uh, you can't ever hear me or you can't see any of the videos because sometimes that happens and then I'm just like rocking out thinking it's going on. But uh that's life in the Zoom era. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. You should see uh, a little desk there with some curtains. And, um, and then I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation. Thank you so much for having me at UC San Marcos. I got into coding because I wanted to do things that I couldn't do by myself. And m being able to collaborate with machines meant that I could do things that I do poorly faster, and then I could do things that machines do poorly uh, better. <laughs> The first place I started performing was with my mom, who was a storyteller from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. I would play the Iroquois rattle and drum while she told stories. I then became a classically trained opera singer. I started composing and directing and making more and more emerging technology mixed with live performance and opera, and kind of ended up in museums. Nowadays, I use a lot of different media, AR and VR or interactive media to tell stories, co-creating with other types of non-human systems. As an artist or as an activist, I look at the way that the Iroquois Confederacy was built. We said that anything that I'm doing now is the result of seven generations behind me. Anything I do will have a lasting impact on the seven generations ahead of me. We use stories as a way of taking values and ethics and putting them into the core of innovation. I started looking at the media landscape we have now. How do I take information and encode it for future generations? A lot of my work is really about creating an ethical framework for software development and design and articulation of values and ethics within technologies with the understanding that we need to future-proof these. There's a notion that the technology we've created now has outrun us. No one knows how to regulate it. We accidentally opened this Pandora's box and we can't get it all back inside. But actually, we can choose to use technology to build a more just world, a more equitable world. We can demand that. We can say that we want algorithms that are human-centered, that are for our environment, that are pro-democracy. We can articulate the values we want to see in technology and communicate those to seven generations in the future. What do we want to achieve with the culture and social network that we're creating? Okay, so uh, as the bio mentioned, I am also the founder of something called the Stupid Hackathon, and I like to start my talks talking about it because um, it's very funny. Um, so I started the Stupid Hackathon um, when I was living in uh, New York, and I started it while I was a student at the NYU's ITP program. We also are known as the Center for Recently Possible. It's kind of a strange art and technology uh, space. And, you know, I had gone to a couple hackathons and uh, I thought that some of the things that we were doing at the hackathons were like trying to solve some of the world's toughest problems in 24 hours with pizza and JavaScript. And I thought, and then oftentimes what people would make like didn't work. And 
and I thought, well, this is kind of stupid. Um, what if we actually made a hackathon where that was just the entire point? And uh, the interesting thing about the stupid hackathon is it actually became kind of a global phenomenon. We we created it. We didn't really realize, you know, I didn't really realize it was going to become as popular as it was. And then suddenly there were stupid hackathons in almost every city that I travel to all around the world. And I love traveling to other cities and meeting the collective uh, stupid hackers that are, are still uh, going strong. So maybe you have had one at your university. Um, a lot of times when I give talks at universities, people in the audience are like, yes, I started the stupid hackathon two years ago. So um, anyways, if you have had one, awesome. If not, um, feel free to get together and um, even maybe do one online. Uh, here's a very stupid video that we made for the 2017 hackathon promotion. It's called Small Talk, a device that allows users to quickly exit uncomfortable social situations. That's it. Um, here is uh, some other things that people have made at the Stupid Hackathon. So the interesting thing about the Stupid Hackathon is all of the things you make are very stupid and useless, and yet they also work in the sense that they do the stupid thing that they're supposed to do. So this is a, a floppy disk drive that's actually the size of an original floppy disk, so you can't even put a JPEG on it. Um, this is another good one. That's really my dog, sorry. <laughs> he always gets fooled by that doorbell. Um, I love that VR doorbell. Um, this one is the non-ad blocker. So it doesn't block ads. It blocks everything except ads. And it's a Chrome extension. And I actually got sued by ad block. Um, and they were saying like, you know, you've ripped us off. And I said, no, 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 We block everything except ads. Um, it's a joke. And they didn't understand that. But I also said I also didn't make this. I just am the host of the hackathon. So it was very funny. Um, and then I got to include them suing me in part of one of our stupid hackathons as well. Well, anyways, uh, this one's great. It's how to play Pong with your eye tracking, controlling the controllers, but you can't look at the screen in order to control it. So um, that's a really good one. I like this one. This is a wi -Fi, human Wi-Fi absorption. So it looks like you need... One, two, three, four, five. Five people to 96% absorb the Wi-Fi. Good job. This one is uh, Soylent for Women. It's pink and twice the price. Uh, this one I like too, Godoify. Um, it just creates those three dancing dots uh, forever. <laughs> I like that. Um, this is great. This one is a cheese... 3D printer. They also used frosting. So the interesting thing is, like, like I said, they... You know, it's a really dumb idea to make a 3D printer out of cheese, um, but then they went ahead and did it. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know. It's pretty, uh, a very fun hackathon. Um, this one is um, Telepresence Rando. Like you've heard of Telepresence Robots, but you can just strap an iPad on a rando's face and then you can be telepresent in a meeting. Um, telepresence rando. This is out cognito mode. So in this one, it's a Chrome extension rather than incognito mode, which may uh, like be somewhat private, not really that private, but um, this one actually tweets everything that you do. So like if you typed pancakes, if you went to allrecipes.com, if you typed in delicious food, every single thing that you type in your Chrome, it will tweet it <laughs> out cognito mode. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, maybe how I view technology in playful and fun ways. And I really love to build uh, things that really work that are maybe in strange or weird worlds. I like virtual reality because to me, 
I think of it like a dream technology. I call it dream technology because it's like you're walking without walking. You're talking without talking. You're communing with other people who aren't really there. Um, and so it reminds me a lot of the way in which uh, dreams function within our creative lives and within our, our psychological daily experiences. Um, so I, I was approached by my friend, uh, uh, Alicia Rayner, who's an actress from a TV show called Orange is the New Black. And she was producing this film and starring in this film called Egg. Um, that was starring um, Christina Hendricks, who's another uh, actress. And in the film, uh, Alicia Rayner's character is playing an artist who's making a virtual reality piece and then showing it to her best friend, Christina Hendricks. And Alicia Rayner thought it was a really good idea if instead of just having like kind of a fake VR experience for the film, they they actually had an, a, a real VR artist, uh, me, uh, make a real VR piece, uh, which I made, and then they could show it to Alicia Rayner. Uh, uh, Christine Hendricks in the film and it could be in the film but then also when people went and saw the film at Tribeca or at um, you know whatever film festival they're going to see the film they could also experience the VR experience so I, I created that and I created a piece called Your Hands Are Feet and it's a kind of a well I'll, I'll show you a little video about what it is about. There is that really crazy sound effect when the giant's leg gets shaved. That's this really strange sponge that I bought that's the worst sponge ever. Like, it's so bad at scrubbing dishes. And we sat there and we were listening to it and we were like, this is, this is the sound of shaving a giant's leg. This is perfect. I started out kind of my creative career as a writer and I was I was really interested in kind of experimental writing that leverage different um, aspects of new technologies. So I got to this point where I was like, it's really fun to think about technology and how it's impacting us, but I would really rather be working directly with the technologies. I went to a grad program called ITP and I learned how to code. In my last year of grad school, VR suddenly came onto the scene as like, something that was going to be accessible for us to use. You know, Sarah was the first person I had met as an artist who was just working in VR in a more playful way. We just started brainstorming and thinking of moments when you virtually give someone a piece of your life, like in, in daily life. If I'm talking to Sarah and I'm trying to explain to her how I felt that morning or what I was thinking about the future, very frequently we prototype those kinds of experiences with sayings or with metaphors. So I can say like, I walked into that room and my stomach just dropped, or it was so like loud that I felt like my ears were bleeding. Your Hands or Feet is a VR experience. It's an interactive exploration of new metaphors. The experience starts off where you're in kind of this surreal looking kitchen and you have in front of you a half dozen carton of eggs and inside of each egg is contained an experience that has some kind of psychologically complex action to it that we hope acts as something that you think back on and you're like, wow, this is such a strange feeling. It kind of reminds me of, for instance, like that time that I felt like my hands were feet. I don't know, I feel like my mind is a confusing machine. What we're really doing here is we're creating these metaphors that like maybe don't exist, but might apply in a situation as like the perfect way to describe this thing. In the beginning, I started with a basic treatment, so I created a lot of 3D assets to just sort of mock up this world, sort of the look and feel. And we came up with this idea of having it be like a half dozen experiences from, you know, a half egg carton and how we would move from each, each space. Landing on the visuals for any project is an interesting process. You know, you have to make something that feels true to something that you like, but it also has to be something true to what the other person likes. 
Sarah said she had this amazing friend, Neve Bavarsky, in LA, who was an uh, illustrator. We reached out to Neve and you know, showed him all of the reference imagery, showed him our very tight color palette of what we were trying to go for. And we were like, can you do the Neve version of your hands or feet universe? And then from there, um, we were like, how are we gonna put this thing together? Because translating from 2D into 3D seems easy, but to keep the same visual style is not always so straightforward. It made a lot of sense like for us to approach it with a style that's inviting and not like, depressing or scary but just a little bit scary maybe it's really helpful to like take those two concepts and then give it to one person that can execute that so that it stays really consistent so we were like let's try this tool medium which is a 3d um, vr sculpting tool and so we felt like oh this is perfect that we found this this way to find like a slice of what we were interested in, in a way that we can produce it in a really organic and fun way and that's kind of how we landed on the visual style that we're at right now a lot of our music is going to be generative. So generative music is when you're really designing those whys, therefores, and ifs. You know, normally you listen to a song and it's got the beginning and the middle of the end and there's like nothing you can do about it. But in an interactive song, there's ways that you can alter parts of it so that way you're sort of participating with the music. Every object that you pick up is like contains an audio track. Depending on which objects you interact with, you're really flushing out what the soundscape of that environment is. Me and Sarah are doing all this work to create a really fun playground. We might have kind of serious concepts about the emotional resonance behind each of the interactions, which we have very long and engaged conversations about. Like, even the, the physicality of grabbing that object, that action has to be connected. So we want each of the interactions to also be analogous to a place in time that you might have had that feeling. When I look at it from an outside perspective, I'm like, a lot of these things have to do with frustration, but a lot of them also have to do with joy and feeling joy while doing something frustrating. And so I want to give people a moment where they can interact with that quality of VR, where they can say, this is an extension of my brain and my experience within the world. This isn't the real world. This is the computational amalgamation of human understanding in this world. And I want to give people an opportunity to interact with that and interface with that. When we explain it to people, they just get it and they're excited about it, even though it's like, oh, it's like an experience where your hands are feet because don't you ever just feel like a weird feeling and you don't know how to describe it and it's like something you've never felt before. Well, isn't VR the perfect way to kind of explore that? And people are like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I'm like, really? <laughs> so that's been pretty surprising also. So that's my city, New York. I'm I'm uh, born and raised New Yorker, but also my tribe is uh, is from there. Our our uh, ancestral territory is up in upstate New York and the northeast part of the United States and Canada. Um, and you know, I was approached by someone in the mayor's office at the city of New Rochelle. And if you don't know where New Rochelle is in New York, that's okay. It used to be part of the Bronx, and it's above the Bronx, which is the northernmost part of, um, you know, the five boroughs in in Manhattan. Um, and in they were interested in creating maybe an artist district or a museum or a, you know some kind of art art center that would be an interesting place and they came to me because i worked in art and technology and they said well maybe that would be unique or interesting for our community to have something be um, very tech forward and so i thought wow that's really exciting at the time i was working in um i a lab that i founded uh called the DB dbrs innovation lab which was working f with creative applications of machine learning technologies and I thought AI was like the absolute edge of the frontier and then um, when someone gave me an opportunity to work in the real world <laughs> in a city I thought that's really exciting that's like a whole other um, next level to building virtual worlds and building um, computational worlds and now actually b building a real world um, and so what I did is I created a citizen toolkit um, where we co-designed our city with citizens and city planners using augmented reality and virtual reality and artificially intelligent systems. Um, and then we actually, for the uh, this project that I created, won um, the Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge 
challenge, which was a, a million dollar prize um, where uh, city leaders could could use this Bloomberg funds to do really cutting edge um, innovative work without the putting the burden on taxpayers, but but having the benefit go to the community and to citizens. Um, so this is an image of us at the every week we would go to the New Rochelle um, farmers market that was at the library and we would have citizens go into all these different experiences and think about trade-offs and co-design what they wanted that actual specific area the library and the library green park to look like so they could look at out at the actual green and then have the augmented reality you know vision of that space and kind of really imagine what um what their future could be designed uh together we also had a truck that we would drive around to different neighborhoods and inside the truck was room scale vr and people could kind of simulate that same experience um I've another fun thing that I did with VR is I worked with one of my dear friends, Wendy Redstar. Uh, she's also indigenous. She's Crow uh, from River Crow from uh, outside of Billings, Montana. And here we are on Red Star Ranch on her family land on her reservation. And um, we're both Google Jumps creators, which meant that they gave us this research camera that they had, which was a 360 video uh, camera, had 17 cameras and some depth um, sensing as well. So it was like somewhat depth and uh, 360. And we carried this around. We thought, this is great. Both of us are indigenous. Both of our indigenous uh, uh, cultural traditions have stories about these monsters called the little people. And we thought, this is great. We'll film the ones in, you know, the Crow little people. We'll film, go to upstate New York to where my ancestral territory is to go to like Ganondigan or that other area up in, in Victor, New York and like film where stories of little people are there. And then this will be great. And then we'll show it. And, you know, this is going to be great. And then as we were traveling around, in Montana um, on her reservation, we decided to meet with the elders who still knew the stories of the little people. Um, there were even uh, a, an episode of Unsolved Mysteries that filmed it on her reservation about the little people and they said the little people would dress up as Elvis. I mean, it's, you can't make this stuff up. Um, so we went around and we met all these elders who were talking about like, oh, were you here when like that dumb episode was filmed here? Or like, you know, we kind of started talking to them about the little people in all the different locations. And then um, one of the elders said that actually the little people People means uh, in Crow language means the keepers of the land. And as we started discovering more about the stories of the little people, uh, we started asking the elders, you know, like, tell us your story, you know, and each of them had stories of, you know, 60 plus years of being keepers of this land, of being advocates and activists for the people, for the sacred sites, for the unity, for the community of the Crow people. And we thought to ourselves, actually, we we are in search of the little people, but really these people are the keepers of the land. These are not a mythological beings. These are the spirits who are working hard um, to bring balance to our community and to the environment. And so we actually decided to kind of change what we what we did and we created this installation um, and this is at Newark uh, Museum but it kind of toured around the United States um, but if you see that image is the image of you know like a sweat lodge you might see on a reservation from the outside we put it in a gallery and then in the inside of it is actually the footage that we took on the reservation and we're really asking the question to the audience would you like to be a monster are you one of us? Can you fiercely protect the land? Or are you going to be afraid of the monsters and sort of demonize them? So it's kind of asking, you know, like, do you want to be a monster with us? And the fun thing about this space is even if you've never seen a sweat lodge, even if you don't know what that is, it does remind everyone kind of of like a blanket fort you might make as a child and you can imagine going inside of this blanket fort and having story time with myself and Wendy and naturally I mean we couldn't even help ourselves when we were there we would get inside and we would just start telling stories <laughs> we would start telling the stories of the little people we tell the stories of this trip we would tell the stories of um, um of keepers of the land and ask people to share theirs as well so um, I like to bring in, in some of my traditional indigenous practices into some of it, conversation with these new forms of art and technology. Um, and one example is uh, this work that I did at the Minneapolis in Institute of Art um, using digital beadwork. And I used to bead all the time um, when I worked primarily as a performance artist. And so my work was myself traveling on planes, you know, to Asia or to Europe all the time. And I was just always on planes. And so I would bead as a way of just kind of 
passing the time and calming myself on the airplane. And then it got to a point where TSA really didn't like me bringing all my porcupine quills and really long, weird native <laughs> needles and all this stuff. And they're like, you cannot bring this stuff on the plane. So I, just, I was like, what am I going to do? So I started making um, my same traditional beadwork that I used to make and that I was trained by the elders in my tribe or that, you know, they taught me to do. Um, and I started making them just using my phone, you know, and just uh, using these very inexpensive or free 3D design tools on my phone. And then I would export those and import them into Unity or Cinema 4D or any kind of like 3D cinematic software and start making virtual worlds either in VR or in video. Um, so that's like one example of how you can take some of your uh, traditional um, knowledge and use it with new materials. I also like to uh, think about the the sort of ethics and values that are in my cultural tradition and how those can be also inscribed, not just the designs and the stories, but in 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 my culture, you know, I'm Seneca Cayuga Nation of Oklahoma Deer Clan, we're Iroquois Confederacy, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a bit. Um, but we have a lot of values that we actually inscribe into the designs uh, that we do in our arts and crafts, into the stories that we tell in the songs. So it's it's multimedia, the way that we encode our values. You don't, can't really separate them from each other. And so um, I'm, I'm interested in other groups as well that are finding universal ethics and everything that we do. And um, as it was mentioned earlier, I was a delegate um, to His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama in Dharmashala, India. And part of what, um, you know, this group that was a delegation was primarily around art and museums and large institutions and how they too can be centers for universal ethics. And uh, the reason why he was interested in meeting with this group and why I specifically was brought is he's building a, a museum um, for Tibetan history and culture and values, but it's really centered on universal ethics. And since so many Tibetan people are actually, um, you know, in the United States, they're all over the world, it's a very large diaspora, he wanted there to be a way in which Tibetans all over the world could come into community with this museum. So it wasn't just a physical building in Dharmshala and at his home, but it could be something that people were able to participate in, um, possibly using virtual reality. So I was there to kind of show him, um, you know, I don't know the ins and outs of this, but it's a still evolving project. And um, if you're interested in helping or knowing more, uh, just let me know. So this is a wampum shell. I also have a analog one that you can see through a different digital window here. Um, <laughs> so it, we, at the Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee people made beads out of this, uh, a binary structure, purple and white, and we weave them into belts. Um, these belts were the result of conversational consensus, built contracts in witness of our communities that were regarding all formats of life, government, trade, beliefs, etc. Um, this is the our great law of peace, the Hiawatha belt. Um, and, uh, you know, we would weave these together after a long period of de deliberation at, as a visual representation of a complex series of contracts and agreements that resulted from community consensus led negotiation. So I'm going to read you a statement from the American Indian Institute of New York. Um, this is their image of um, our Hiawatha belt uh, in a museum. And uh, this is their statement. Before the idea of inalienable rights, liberty, and democracy were strung together in words, they were strung together in beads made of shells. In this Iro Iroquois Confederacy wampum belt, our Hiawatha belt, it represents 1,000 years of democratic principles that we Indians shared with our newer brothers and sisters, including Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, who openly acknowledged in speeches and writing that our contribution formed the basis of the U.S. Constitution. We shared our belief that leaders should represent and serve the people, which was a startling belief in a world of kings and queens. We shared what we call the great law, which is the natural law of human dignity that proceeds and underlies all other laws. Even we the people began as an ancient Indian phrase, and it's important in the pursuit of all of our happiness that we the people now means and continues to mean we, all of us who are Americans. The Iroquois Confederacy is the oldest living participatory democracy on earth. 
Um, in the U.S. Congress memorialized uh, our history and honored the Haudenosaunee in 1988 uh, with the House Congress Resolution uh, 331, which states, whereas the confederation of the original 13 colonies into one republic was influenced by the political system developed by the Iroquois Confederacy, as were many of the democratic principles which were incorporated into the Constitution itself. Um, from the hearing of the Select Committee on Indian Affairs of the United States 101 Congress First Session on Senate Congressional Resolution 76, the Iroquois Confederacy of Nations, um, John Hancock was quoted as saying when he was uh, signing the Declaration of Independence that uh, to his Iroquois ambassadors, we hope the friendship that is between us and you will be firm and continue as long as the sun shall shine and the waters run and that we and you may be as one people and have but one heart and be kind to one another like brethren. And I would like to read you this statement. And this is uh, some of my digital beadwork. <laughs> if history was written by the victors, then the future will be written by the vectors. Artificial intelligence will radically change our world, our lives, our planet, and it remains to be seen if it will be a positive or a negative. If it's said that those who fail to study history are doomed to repeat it, I would add that those who ignore data have underfitted models. When Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were looking for a new model to serve as a basis for the United States government, they were very impressed by the Iroquois Confederacy. We call ourselves the Haudenosaunee, people of the Longhouse. We're made up of the Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, Onondaga, Mohawk, and Tuscarora. Thomas Jefferson spent over a year with us in upstate New York in one of our largest cities. When Jefferson and Franklin and the other founding fathers drafted the U.S. Constitution, they cherry-picked the best parts that were most beneficial to their own political purposes, the bits that seemed to align the best with their Enlightenment-era ideology, representation, voting, checks and balances, etc. But they left out the social and cultural networks that sustained these practices in the actual Iroquois Confederacy. Well, what do they leave out? In the Iroquois Constitution, women, clan mothers from each tribe were the only ones who could vote for the representative who was always a man, a chief. Actually, the word for clan mother and chief is the same word. There was a balance of power. Only men could serve and only women could vote. Their economy was driven through complex agricultural arrangements. Everyone in the community participated in planting and harvesting. It was not an economy of slavery dependent plantation agriculture. This is an example of colonial mindset. I see it, I like it, I want it, I'll take it. I take it and I take what will benefit my own paradigm, but I'm unconcerned with the effect it will have being taken out of context and the effect it'll have on the people I take it from. This is like trying to run a program without checking its dependencies. What if it turns out that the Confederate democracy or lasting peace and prosperity is dependent upon a balance of power along gender lines? or upon a different economic model than the one practiced by European settlers in North America? Or what if it imagines a system of agriculture where the environment is protected and maintains sus sustainable practices? We all have colonial mindset, just because our culture has colonial mindset. But here's the thing, we're not colonial subjects, and we don't have to live under a colonial empire anymore. In data science, we talk about models suffering from either overfitting or underfitting. Overfitting is when a model exhibits a low degree of bias, but a high degree of variance. In other words, it accepts a lot of differences within the data, but it doesn't have very much predictive power. Underfitting is the inverse of this, high bias, low variance. This is what happens when you make a generalization without enough data, or when the data is not diverse enough to represent the real world. The big problem with colonial mindset is one of underfitting, extracting idea without the context that made that idea work in the first place. I'm here to say, don't colonize our future. Our plans for the future need to include more data from diverse cultures and societies, and not only those ideas that flatter what we already think. For instance, let's say you want to lay the groundwork for a society run on the blockchain. What does that look like? How does that work? What are the consequences? If we don't have significant data, we might just have to wing it. But we actually have thousands of years of data about decentralized economies. The use of wampum, um, among the Iroquois functioned as a decentralized distributed ledger of contracts, and it helped us govern, govern our society for centuries. Wampum is an example of what I've termed antecedent technology, and there are many more cases like this. In South America, the Inca had a Turing complete system of knot tying called Kipu, 
which predated modern computing by hundreds of years. When we want to use powerful new technologies such as AI or blockchain, and we want as much data as we can to help us imagine positive change in the world, we do not need to throw out thousands of years of data that can fuel the next giant leaps our communities will make with technology. I want people to know that indigenous people had technologies that have solved complex issues. I want us to use their data to help us dream our future, and I want us to believe that just because we have had 500 years of slavery, worker exploitation, poverty, and gender imbalance, we have had thousands of years of peace, prosperity, and equality right here in the country where I'm standing right now. So I want to show you a our Hiawatha belt that we um, made uh again and then show you a version that george washington made and gave to the cayuga nation um in 1794 to show that he understood uh wampum that he understood our great law of peace and that he too wanted to create uh you know a, his version um to lead the 13 colonies into peace and prosperity and you'll notice right away a couple of differences between these so this is george washington's belt um, and then this is our Hiawatha belt. We have in the center the great uh, tree of peace, our great white pine, that it is said we buried all of our weapons of war underneath the roots um, of this tree in order to form this peaceful confederacy um, that was built on this confederate democracy. So you can see right away it's centered in the environment and in peace. And then each of the squares that come out of the tree symbolize one of the once warring nations, Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, Onondaga, Mohawk, Tuscarora. And then if you notice with George Washington's, the center is the house, a building, the government, a man-made structure. And then each of the representatives of these 13 colonies is a singular man. And then you notice right away, like just how right in the beginning of understanding um, the sort of building blocks of our peace and prosperity, how different um, something can be when you base something on like a, a unit of a tribe uh, based upon the environment and harmony within it. And then also, um, if you imagine that uh, each of those colonies is symbolized through uh, one man that owns property, and that's kind of ha what happened too, whereas we had uh, you know, women that voted and men who were chiefs. Um, at this time when we were created a, a 13 colony, only those who or men who owned property were able to vote. So it, in, right in that middle, it's like it was forked and a little bit of malware entered into the source code. I like to say. Um, so I've been working for the last year and a half on a project called Wampum.codes. Wampum.codes is a couple of different parts. It's a podcast uh, where I interview indigenous uh, technologists, artists, creatives, uh, thought leaders, activists, really cool people um, who are using new technologies to make positive change in their communities. And some of them might be like comedians who are using technology in, as a new form of um, community building and comedy and, and, and helping other indigenous uh, native comedians, very diverse group of people. Um, listen to it if you like podcasts. Uh, another part of Wampum.codes is I wanted to bring these like-minded indigenous thought leaders together in order to talk about what inspires them and how they put their values into practice using technology. Um, there is not a set of universal guiding principles for indigenous people. Oh, we're very diverse. <laughs> However, it is my desire to take the wisdom from this inspiring group um, the, of Wampum.codes and hopefully offer up a new framework for designing software ethically. If you like it, great. And if you cannot see why it's uniquely indigenous, I'm not sure that that matters. Let's make the world a better place. Indigenous wisdom is about movement, love, time, and responsibility. So maybe try it out and see if it, if it unlocks something that you care about. If it does, then I hope that as a, a small way that you can pay it forward, that you remember to include indigenous people in all of the meaningful projects that you do. So part of what I've created is a concept for ethical dependencies for software development. I've written about it in the Mozilla blog. If you'd like to read more, um, I, the article is called Indigenous Wisdom for, as a Model for Software Design and Development. I also do these workshops uh, where I help teams that are made up of coders, designers, builders, the people who are really making these types of new technologies, not necessarily someone very high up in, in the company with a role around ethics or somebody who is an expert in ethics and technology. Um, you know, a, a couple of years ago, the head of uh, 
of artificial intelligence was at Google and who was also a, you know, a prestigious person in, in a university and the head of an AI initiative there as well, was asked um, by, by publicly at a conference, um, what do you think about ethics and artificial intelligence? And he said, you know, that's above my pay grade. And I thought, you know, if it's above his pay grade, <laughs> then like, who are we hoping is going to come down and help us uh, or make these decisions around how to build software ethically? If, if we were building a bridge and someone said, you know, how, how many pounds can I drive my truck across before I will have a structural load problem? Um, and then possibly this bridge could collapse and I could, you know, damage it or, or, or cause, um, you know, great destruction or even death to other drivers who are on the bridge and if the person who's building the bridge said I don't you know I don't know I just am like the one who builds it you know like whether people die or not or whether people like are hurt or not it's actually like I'm I'm neutral <laughs> right like we wouldn't really let somebody say that they're neutral if they're building something that's for the public good and I think software has gotten a little bit of a pass in that way where people are saying I'm just building these neutral tools how they're used or how they create harm um, is isn't really in the responsibility of those who are creating it but you know there's kind of a shift right now in Silicon Valley and there are companies and teams that are interested in this and so I've been doing these workshop for blockchain companies, nonprofits, think tanks, um, financial institutions who are actually thinking really deeply about these things. And so I do these workshops with them to kind of help their communities and their builders and their coders to write into the source code their values and their ethics. Um, and another part about wampum.codes is I'm working with the National um, Institute for Women in Computing to create a cash award for... Um, for indigenous technologists who are interested in working at the center of ethics and technology. And so that will hopefully help, you know, more research and more indigenous people um, bring their incredible ideas to the forefront to solve some of the most pressing issues we're facing today in our field of technology. Um, something that was a really incredible thing I got to do this last year um, and a really wonderful uh, uh, cohort and community that I was a part of was the Four Freedoms hashtag 2020 awakening. Um, you may have read about us in the New York Times. We're also known as the Wide Awakes. Um, something that we did, it, well, you know, the thing about the Wide Awakes and Four Freedoms is it's a artist-led super PAC. And so an interesting thing is if you have ever been a part of a nonprofit um, and you want to make social change, you're, you kind of have a certain sphere in which you're able to influence. But if you're if you actually take any of that um, of those financial dollars and put them towards changing policy, it's actually not allowed um, because in order to do that, you need to be more registered as a super PAC. And so artists who are really interested in changing policy and said, hey, you know, like maybe there's a different way in which we can engage uh, with our civic responsibility rather than just influencing opinion. We could actually, you know, try to to, to put our creative talent and 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 dollars to use uh, changing policy. And so what we did with this um, artist-led super PAC created by uh, Hank Willis Thomas, amongst others, um, is right before the November elections is we created this um, billboard project where there was a billboard in every state in America, um, including Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, um, Alaska, and we had these billboards that would really ask people different questions, promote ideas from BIPOC artists, and really think about what would civic engagement look like if artists were actually leading the fray. And you may have seen a lot of the work that we did in Georgia, where artists were showing up to the polls, you know, dancing and playing music and dressed in really incredible costumes to try to bring civic joy back to these public spaces. Um, and especially in the era of like very contentious elections, like can we bring back joy and unity um, to these spaces? So this is a um, the billboard that I made. This is at the Anchorage Museum um, in Alaska. And the question that I posed here is what is made bright by the loss of your light? And the Guardian asked me to write a statement about it. And this is the statement that I wrote. During the global pandemic, an increasingly contentious political landscape and the surge of energy from rededicating ourselves to racial justice in America, I've witnessed my incredible peers balance fear, bravery, a commitment to family and to local and global communities of underrepresented people. I've seen them create art in response and build new systems of support. But among my friends, especially my female identifying friends, and especially those of us who are mothers, many of us are being asked to do the undoable daily. I wanted a message to remind the world that through change making, we can't let ourselves become kindling. I don't want us to burn out. 
All the crises in the world today are asking us to run more and more current through the little filaments of our minds and souls. But when those go out, does it leave the world a brighter place? Of course it doesn't. The social, economic, physical, political, intellectual demands of a movement must bring with it the great care for and value of each human being who is a part of it. Um, and this is uh, the continuation of our project after the election. We, we took a lot of these billboards and put them in other places, including the Chinese Theater in Los Angeles, um, different spaces in Times Square. Um, and then it's, you know, still at the, actually, it's no longer at the Museum of Alaska. It, uh, a storm came and blew it away. <laughs> so it's no longer there. Um, and then um, most recently yesterday, uh, I've, I've been working with this incredible artist, um, a, a pop star named uh, Claire George. And yesterday she released um, a single from her new debut album called Pink Elephants. And I'm working with her to create um, an NFT uh, that's in response to Pink Elephants and, and the greater narrative of the album and some of her writing. Um, and, I, you know, if you want to talk more about NFT, I'd love to in, in the Q&A. It's an interesting space. It's um, exciting and it's controversial. And I think it's important for uh, BIPOC artists to consider it or, or think about it, even if you don't want to participate in it. Um, but just to understand it, I think is very powerful. And then... Um, definitely check out Claire's new single, which is is very adorable. I think her music is incredible. Um, and then the second, oh, I can watch a little bit of it here. Um, and so the last thing I'd like to share with you is um, a creative collective that I've created <laughs> called uh, no-funding.com. Uh, so what is no-funding.com? I'll read you our press release just because I think it's funny. Um, no Funding, the newest project from Stupid Hackathon, co-author Amelia winger is a mutual aid network that aims to create help creatives radically rethink our relationships to funding, grants, and gatekeeping. In an arts and media culture increasingly focused on securing patronage from institutions, corporations, and wealthy individuals, no funding asks what creative life would look like if artists were fully liberated from money and the self-censorship of imposed by its pursuit. Rather than experience the soul-crushing lifestyle of striving, rejection, and constant jockeying for position, could we instead find new ways to support one another and what would we make? As part of the official announcement of no funding, um, I created a short story called Child's Play, where uh, Winger Bears can imagine a world in which children seize control of the global economy with nothing more than a Minecraft server and their grandparents' goodwill. No Funding is a public group. Visit no-funding.com to get in on the fun and participate in weekly online conversations where members uh, present on topics near and dear to them. No Funding is primarily BIPOC creative technologists, but it's open to anyone who's ever needed a day job to make something cool that they believe in. Our motto is no striving, no hustling. Nofunding.com, a creative collective. Um, and so I, I welcome all of you to join that. Uh, a fun thing is that I give these talks at universities every week and then people join No Funding and I get to see them in the rooms that we do there, which is incredibly fun. Um, so thank you so much. And I see there's a couple questions in the Q&A, which I'll check out in a minute, but I'll give you a second right now to screen cap this. Um, if you'd like to connect with me, I'm on every social. <laughs> so just like, you know, send me a message um, and then feel free to join uh, No Dash funding.com
All right. Thank you so much, Amelia, for that amazing presentation. Um, so much <laughs> to unpack. And, and I think, thank you for your very generous, I think, framing of the work that you do and the context in which it takes place. Um, as Christine uh, and I were uh, sharing at the beginning of the presentation and engagement, uh, we had some students submit uh, some questions ahead of time uh, based on some of the case studies uh, that you actually spoke about tonight. Um, but we also have some questions uh, in the Q&A coming in. So I, we thought we could maybe go back and forth um, between those. So I don't know, uh, should we start maybe with something that came in through the Q&A? Oh, sure. Yeah. Whatever you guys want. <laughs> well, there's a, a few questions here that um, I think one that we could uh, just address immediately because you ended with that. Somebody just asked, uh, what is an NFT? So if you could yeah. describe that a little better. Yeah, <laughs> totally. So it, it stands for, you know, it's like everything else where there's these things that stand for something that's not really what it means. Like when someone says an API, you're like, okay, I can define like what those three letters mean, but then that actually isn't what it means like in the sense of how you use it or what's the point of it or why does this matter right so nft stands for non-fungible token which like does that mean anything eh. but what it means or why there's kind of like a lot of controversy or interest or or what what's the whole deal and why you should care kind of thing is is um you know for I would say since like the you know 1980s, a lot of us have been what people call crypto anarchists who are interested in taking technology and applying it to all areas of, of commerce and values and storytelling and art and, and communication. And there have been many, 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 many different attempts at making art that is able to have a community value um, outside of the traditional art market. And the NFT is just the most recent recent one and it's the way it works is essentially there's different types of marketplaces um, like foundation is one where you can go and you can purchase a, a work of art using a cryptocurrency I think with foundation it's primarily ethereum and and then and that's it right that's kind of the basic idea um, and then underneath that is essentially you're making an API call for a JSON object that would connect you to a repository in an S3 bucket or in a Cloudinary link or somewhere in a database somewhere that actually has the JPEG, which is a computational representation of an artwork that was created in either a JPEG or a GIF or an MOV file, right? That's like the actual bits and bytes of it, right? Like the actual technology of what's happening there. Um, but what you read about a lot in the news is people saying the most expensive artwork that was ever sold was recently sold on NFT. Um, and those things are and aren't true. Um, it's kind of like it, you kind of have to go in a layer deep and, and look at, at what that means. Um, but I think it's exciting and interesting. It's controversial. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of support. There's a lot of hate. And I think it's interesting to read about it right now because it's happening and it's probably the most widely uh, understood or participated in new type of currency around the art world, which is interesting to me. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, we have a follow up from Molly, um, who is wondering if there's a negative effect of an NFTs, uh, specifically as they pertain to the environment. Yes, that's a very popular piece of, I would say, I don't know if I want to say misinformation because it's not necessarily false, but it's a very popular thing that you'll hear in any kind of hand in hand conversation is like, NFT, it's weird in crypto. Art is weird and pointless. Both of these things are destroying the environment. And I'm not saying, Molly, I'm not saying you're saying these things, Molly, at all. I'm just saying that these you hear these kind of couplings. And I think it's important for us to peel back what they're talking about. Because I think the kind of baseline of that argument is... Um, you need to use computational cycles of a GPU in order to do proof of work versioning of a blockchain type. Okay. Like I'm saying, we're getting into like all these like bits and bytes of, in of information, right? But that's just kind of the basis of it. You can also do proof of stake as, as well, which is a different type. And people will say, in order to have a GPU do a turn cycle, you're using electricity and electricity hurts the environment. And that's kind of the basis of the argument right there. And I would say that basis of that argument is a falling cards in which I case I would say is what type of distribution, consu consumption, or interaction of any digital system does not 
use electricity or a GPU turn cycle? And the answer is none. And so it's interesting that NFTs have been called out as specifically harming the environment, whereas like a Twitter feed is not or a Zoom call is not. And I'm not saying that I don't believe that it's not important to just absolutely protect our environment because I am very pro environment and I actually wish to change technology so that it's in harmony more with the values, um, you know, that I hold as an indigenous person. So that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, why are we calling out NFTs? And I think it's because we see an inherent uselessness in art. And I, th I think that's my personal opinion is that that's why these two things are coupled. Whereas, well, Twitter's that's necessary. <laughs> Whereas, uh, just a JPEG, why should anything be wasted in its creation? I think that's interesting to me. I challenge that. But that is the argument that is out there. And it's not that I think it's untrue, because I think we are using um, most of our world's resources in in terrible ways in order to sustain the kind of unsustainable capitalism that we have with um, this concept of like always new and new and newer technologies. However, we've never seen technology that's been centered around the environment and with all the innovation that we have in all these incredible and brilliant minds throughout the world, if we were focused on creating technology that was sustainable, we might have computers that are fully made of pneumatic tubes and air and things that aren't like limited like lithium ion batteries. Like we don't like, the innovation and ingenuity of humans is vast. And if we recentered our values on things where we wanted to protect the environment, we could. And actually, specifically NFTs, um, mostly are purchased with, like I said, Ethereum type of blockchain, which is primarily run on solar. So again, I question these statements. Great, thank you for that clarification. Um, I think on a related note, um, we had a couple of students um, who I think responded to the ways in which uh, VR could be seen as something that destabilizes this notion of like high art. Um, so for example, Anaisa wrote, uh, considering the hundreds of years of gatekeeping in arts and classifications of high art, do you feel changes in technology and creative expression have led to more accessible forms of art making? And similarly, uh, Rianne also wrote that she has experience actually using VR and she really enjoyed the process because it was freeing from the construct and exclusiveness of high art. Uh, so she also wanted to know if you think uh, VR will become more popular and eventually become a kind of uh, primary medium for art. Thank you so much for those um, reflections and questions and comments there. I think, um, you know, VR is a really interesting medium, like many other digital mediums before it and after. And it's at an interesting stage, right? Like J when Jaron Lanier first created the first type of hackable VR set that was using a Nintendo 64, some LED, uh, you know, screens you could literally glue onto sunglasses and then kind of had it released it on the web to all of us like very young hackers who are just kind of like cruising through the internet and downloading this how to guide and m being able to make VR. That was like really the first citizen VR where anyone outside of a very exclusive research lab, like he was actually at Nintendo making the higher end or version of that. And then he released this kind of like, you know, the DP, K2 kit of the the 90s right um and that was the first time that any any sort of like person like us was able to just grab this technology and be able to to use it and then since then there hasn't been a lot of ways outside of like research and development or academic or or maybe even you know like governmental uses of these systems until now with the DK2 and the Oculus Rift and that kind of like a boom of consumer grade technology that being said, it, it, it has kind of hit, hit a little limit at this moment. That doesn't mean it's stopping in any way, but it's like it's gone through another growth spurt where it's saturated a specific type of market. And it is so much more accessible in some ways than VR has, I mean, in every way, in every way that VR has ever been. It's way more accessible now. However, um, it, it still has, has difficulties, right? Like we don't have standardization. We don't have like, it's not like 35 millimeter film when George Eastman created the first 35 millimeter film roll, he standardized a type of photography around the world and made it possible for film and movie houses to suddenly have a standardization. Because before then, it was like people were having all these different types of hacks of ways in which they were projecting light and candles through, uh, you know, glass images or or other different types of film and and creating these movie houses. He created this standardization that made the movie industry like explode, and we don't have that yet. We haven't had like the one type of standard, whether it's the device that it is received on, the even the way in which it's created. And that's cool. 
it's like an interesting Wild West moment where any of us can kind of participate in the formation of the standardization process. But that being said, <coughs> it's still difficult for a lot of people to be able to access or view some of these projects. And just speaking as somebody who, excuse me, <coughs> just speaking as someone who votes on a lot of these like film festival boards or judges different types of, you know, like just, just having us as judges who are experts in this field be able to experience a lot of the pieces that people are creating it's it's total crazy time right like we all have difficulties watching them and then we have to sh rig them up and create like all these attendants for people to come and see them and then at Sundance you may have like I've shown pieces at Sundance you may have like you know okay I have the capacity to have 60 people see my piece a day right like that's not that many right like I fly all the way to Park City and I'm like set up my thing and then 60 people will see it in a day and then actually the power blows out because of you know all of us trying to do the same thing and then no one gets to see it that day and then you know or I my my headset overheats or the computer overheats like there's a million kind of like we're in a funny stage is what I'm saying and so I think it's really exciting to be a part of I'm glad that you're excited to be a part of the early phases of this um but I would I would say that there's I think my favorite group of people that are are aiming to make VR production very accessible um, is the IM4 group, which stands for Immersive um, Media and Matriarchs, because uh, there's four indigenous matriarchs that founded it, and that's at the Emily Carr University. And they have weekly workshops where they help people learn how to do all the different types, like all the way through the production of um, different types of VR and immersive technology. And they're helping people who are, um, you know, on reservations with very little Wi-Fi or with very, you know, light computers. And they've thought of these solutions of compression and accessibility. And they're some of the like really leading people in making um, the production of uh, these technologies uh, very accessible but also making sure that people can be the producers who are from very diverse backgrounds so definitely check them out great um thank you so much there's there's, there's a couple more vr questions i think that maybe we could attend to um and possibly we could ask them together one student asked uh how do you think of your uh, vr work today in light of the pandemic um, how has your approach been uh, modified or not, um, especially around, um, you know, touch? Oh, sorry, and one second. Let me just get my sure. dog to chill out. It's He's okay. like, you've been on Zoom since nine. He wants to walk. I love you, baby. Come here. Come here, Come here baby. Come. Come on, cow. Cow, cow. Everyone else is on Zoom, too. Sorry. Sorry, we're just going to have to have my dog bark. I asked my husband and my son, they're all on Zoom too. So it's a Zoom, <laughs> Zoom party tonight. <laughs> so, sorry about that. That's okay. Um, so my, uh, so the question that I, that I, I'll just restate that. A question that uh, a student asks is, how do you think of your VR work today in light of the pandemic? Has your approach uh, been modified? Are you thinking about it differently? And then I'm going to put that together with another question that somebody uh, popped into our Q&A. Um, uh, about uh, multiplayer applications like VR chat. In your perspective, how do you believe the future of communications with VR? What is it gonna be? Do you believe that there's a new form of communication in the future and does it have a positive or negative impact? So a little bit about the pandemic and VR and a little bit about the future. <laughs> I, I love VR chat. Um, that was probably the first time when I was in alt space VR, um, I was at the Sundance New Frontier Story Lab in like this mountain, you know, with and I went into VR in front of a group of all my peers. There's like 25 people. And that's kind of strange to be like inside of VR where you're blindfolded, but everyone's staring at you. Um, so I went into alt space for the first time and I had, you know, I'd done VR since the 90s in all these like <laughs> different various weird ways. And so I had I didn't really expect to be that shocked by something. But when I went into alt space, I um yeah, I didn't know anything about all space and I kind of just was wandering around the rooms while everyone's staring at me like trying to figure this out and I there it said oh there's one person in this one room so I jump in this one room and there's like a, a very tall person that has a giant like cookie face that's like horrific looking just like it looks like a really weird cookie and I was like hi and and then the cookie man came like walked over to me and like like kind of knelt down because I'm very short and he like knelt down and was like oh hello and I'm like 
So what's going on? And he's like, oh, well, I'm building a replica of the city of Portland. Would you like to help me make trees? And I'm like, sure. So like, so I'm like, I don't know how to do it. And he's like, oh, you like look over your arm and you select these things and you and this is how we make trees in my scale model of Portland. And I was like, that's great. And we were like doing it. And every time he would try to like help me because I was messing everything up, um, he would try to help me. He would like come in to try to help me. And then he would like back off because he's so much bigger than me. Right. Like he was like so much larger. He was oh, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to, is it okay if I, if I just like touch this thing for you? And I thought, this is crazy. We're not in the same room together, right? Like I am in a room in Sundance with 25 people watching me. I, I don't know where Cookie Man is. I don't even know what his real name is. Um, but he was so like polite about my physicality and so aware that I was like a smaller new person. And he used his body as like in this very like polite way of saying, you know, like I respect and I understand that you're a person, it blew my mind. And I didn't expect that to happen um, because I'm like, oh, I like know everything about VR. I'm like such an old hat. But it is true that like this communing with each other in virtual space is so radical. And I think until you experience it, it's very easy to just assume it's kind of like chatting with our fingers or with Zoom, but it's weirder. <laughs> it's like definitely you feel their presence in a really beautiful and intense way. And and also like, I guess the negative side of that, my friend Michelle Cortezi, who's the uh, VP of, of VR at Facebook, she created this paper around VR harassment because that's like the opposite, like the negative thing is that that physicality is really real. So when someone's like crowding you or, or creating a sort of hostile space for you in those same spaces that she researches, um, the, it's like the effects are incredible, like in a negative way. So I think it's very fascinating. Um, so I'm glad you brought up uh, VR chat. And when it comes to the pandemic, um, you know, we've had a difficulty for a lot of the film festivals because it's like I said, it's hard enough to uh, when you have like five attendants, put 60 people through a VR experience you know, at Sundance. And then we did Sundance virtually this year. And so in one way, it's way more accessible because so many more people can attend the festival. Um, but then on the other hand, you don't really have people kind of assisting people in uh, downloading these applications. It's really on you to be like, here's the kit, download it and load it on your, first of all, you have to have a device. And then secondly, you don't really have someone helping you if you've never done VR before. Maybe you went out and bought a device or borrowed one. Um, you might not necessarily know how to to experience it. So that was kind of that's going to be difficult this year with the pandemic. Also, um, you know, it, I don't know how we're going to feel about putting these devices publicly on after a pandemic. Um, you know, because <laughs> it's like not that sanitary. But we try, like we try to sanitize them. But I don't know. It's going to be interesting after the pandemic. I love you, baby. Okay, thank you. It's very sad. <laughs> uh, so we had maybe a f uh, recognizing that we're running out of time here. Uh, maybe just a couple more questions, if that's okay with you, Amelia. Sure. Um, one, uh, or we received, I received several um, thinking through some challenges of using technology. And I think some students were wanting to know if you, uh, how you navigate the challenge of working with technology in such a tech saturated environment uh, where people are maybe desensitized in terms of being surrounded by technology so constantly. Um, so that was one of the challenges that, that people were uh, curious about uh, in terms of how you navigate. And the other one that came up both in the questions and I also see a question here in the chat is if you ever had any uh, backlash or um, difficulty uh, kind of navigating how different generations might relate to technology. So specifically like older generations, if they have like ex experienced a kind of hesitance or resistance to combine traditional knowledge with machine intelligence, for example. Well, you know, I really like working in community with uh, multi-generational groups. So I collaborate a lot with my son, who's a Zoomer. I'm really inspired by the way in which he uses a lot of off-the-shelf technology and it has very much of like a mod culture so that he's doing a lot of coding and community organizing and building, but through these like, you know, baked in systems like Minecraft and Roblox and then rehacking them to create the kind of experiences that his community wants to. And he's been creating these communities 
of hundreds and thousands of people since he was 12 or younger, I guess, 10, and then just building these huge servers with all these people and continuing these stories that have been going for like five years or or so. And um, I'm very inspired by that generation. And also, you know, working with the indigenous matriarchs at IM4, I think is really inspiring too, because those women, um, you know, are grandmothers, but they have been leaders of tech for a long time. And so I think oftentimes we we can equate um, different generations with different levels of proficiency, but I would say that they actually have um, just different um, windows into the type of proficiency. The things that they are interested in building and the reasons um, come from really different levels of experience, which is fascinating to me. And I love to be in community um, multi-generationally. And I like that we have different questions um, that we, we make. Like a lot of the founders of IM4 have worked for many, many years in... <laughs> Hey. hey, hey, what's going on, you guys? What's going on? What's going on? I have a puppy. Sometimes I hope everything is okay. I know. I've never heard them yell like that. What did you guys do? I'm feeding them treats, like trying to keep them happy, and they must have fought over a treat. Also, working with multi-species is very important, too, so, you know, you have to have lots of levels of calm. Um, but, yeah, I, I think also working with cities, you realize how important it is to have many generations because, um, like, a lot of the women who are uh, the matriarchs of IM4 have worked for a long time in children's programming, like on TV and in curriculum, and so they have a very unique take on building. Like, when they look at VR, they'll say, well, this isn't accessible to children because of XYZ, and I'm like, they just know because they've done so much work with building programming for children and then you know working with children is important so that they can explain to you how they are are interacting and things and so it, it definitely changes your understanding of what is accessible right because they all have different concerns of who they want to include in their community what do you think Michelle one more yeah we can maybe do one more <laughs> if that's one or okay. two more okay are you doing okay Amelia yeah, I'll definitely let you do Are you sure? Your two shenanigans. Okay, all right. Too much shenanigans, too much shenanigans you two. Um, there's been a lot of questions from students about your creative process. And so I'm going to just, uh, just read a few and maybe there's something in there that you would like to talk about. Um, some students asked about your process of turning those 2D illustrations with your collaborators into the, the 3D modeling. Um, another person asked about uh, methods that you use to imagine new worlds, you know, if you're thinking about the future, like, how do you get there? Um, and then there was another question around, um, about how, how do you balance, kind of balance your, your conceptual perspective with, um, with something that's more like subjective, I think is the question. So I'm sorry, those all came at once, but <laughs> you can go there in any way you can. Yeah. Well, um, I guess when it comes to the, the 2D and 3D beadwork, um, I download very inexpensive or free software on my phone where you can do 3D modeling with your fingers. And um, then you can export those as like OBJs or whatever you'd like and then bring them into like Blender or Unity or um, Cinema 4D, which is what I did. And then you can use those programs um, in VR. Uh, Cinema 4D isn't really for real time, but you could do like maybe viz, previs, and backgrounds and things like that. Um, and then from taking the 2D images, um, you know, I just do a lot of research on different historical images. And I know a lot about our uh, storytelling practices because of my mother. And so I kind of think of those kind of like this is an example of some of our like 2D imagery. And then we actually do 3D types of beadwork. Like we do layers on top of layers to kind of build out more sculptural shapes of the bead. So I kind of use those same processes, but just in um, in a 3D space. So it's kind of imagining. Also, I get to kind of make the beads really large and stuff in 3D, which is fun because I can't really do that. I mean, I could do that in real life, but it'd just be, it's like, it's like computationally the same amount to make it huge or little when it comes to your phone. So it's kind of fun. Um, so that's how I do that. And I just, I actually, the, the 3D ones, I did it all by myself. I have worked with larger teams on VR projects um, when it warrants it, but the 2D illustration to 3D VR, that's just me. I just do that by myself. So, um, okay. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if anyone's ever had a pit bull, but they is babies. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> big 
he's like a half pit bull, half boxer, but he looks like a greyhound. I don't know. He's a funny guy. Um, so maybe uh, we can end with with the question that we uh, have been asking other presenters, which is just students are curious, like for uh, suggestions and advice. I think someone uh, in the Q and A uh, mentioned that they. Um, are an artist also, and sometimes find it hard to transfer uh, her own ancestors passed down stories into visuals and feel confident uh, that it kind of accurate, that the art that results accurately tells a story. Um, so she wants to know how you know when your visuals are mirroring the stories. That's a really good question. Um, you know, part of the philosophy that we have in Iroquois or Haudenosaunee storytelling, and my mother was a storyteller. I love you, sweetie. Um, she, you know, being an indigenous or being a, a, a Haudenosaunee and Iroquois storyteller is kind of like being a politician, a performance artist, a writer, a producer, <laughs> you know, like a singer. Um, and it's because you are given the stories that you tell from the elders because they trust you. So that's kind of like being a politician or a leader. And then it's really um, important that you retell these stories so that they're relevant, important to solving the problems of your generation and your audience. Audience. So sometimes your audience might be seven year olds, right? And so you need to tell these stories specifically for your time. And I would say the same thing to your student, right? Like, even though these are historical stories from your cultural tradition, it's still your responsibility to, to speak for yourself and to speak to your generation and to your audience. And so you'll be that interpreter who'll find out the appropriate way, um, both visually and through, you know, pacing and your music and the entire creation that you're doing um, to connect it with your generation rather than necessarily feeling as though you're beholden to a right or correct or ancestral way. That right and correct ancestral way is actually to make sure that it connects to your generation. And so I, I always love working, you know, in a community and making sure I have feedback within my community so you can always test it out on people who you respect and say, what do you think? What does this mean to you? You know, and get constant states of iterative feedback. And that can really help you. Oftentimes, um, I think in the beginning of our art careers, we think that we're supposed to somehow have all of these answers and it's supposed to come out in this pure, perfect form. Um, but art is a lot more like dance or any other art form where you, you practice a lot and you, you make sure that uh, you try and you try and you do and you actually make art by making not by having something come out finished so I would encourage um, you to just grab your people that you respect and um, help them help you be in community okay thank you Amelia so much for your time yeah. and uh, sharing your work with us it was uh, it's really um, wonderful I'm looking forward to looking into it more and uh, I love some of these links, I think, or some of these suggestions, places, I'm sure that we can find them online um, that I've been writing down as we've been going along here. Um, is there anything more that you wanted to say before we wrap? Um, well, I always like to plug, you know, no-funding.com. Like a lot of times people after I give talks will say like, I would love to pick your brain or have a coffee or whatever. I'm like, just, you can find me every week at okay. No Funding and we will we always have a chance for people to share what they're working on and to talk about issues that they have. And so I think that's a great forum and you don't get to just meet me. You get to meet like a whole bunch of really other incredible artists that are, are kind of in the same boat as you and creating community. So that's great. Thank you Brilliant. for the invitation. Yeah. Thank you so much again for such an amazing presentation uh, and for the, that resource and making yeah available such, such, I think, wonderful ideas and resources for our students. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. yeah. And thanks. Thanks evening. for sharing your animals. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. If they, you know, it was a little like, hard. They, to have wrangle. A zoom, they have a zoom fatigue tolerance, you know, like once yeah. it's like, if, if I do something after work, then they get mad. If it's like, they understand up until 5 PM, but then they're like, you're still on zoom. And then it starts growling at me. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much again for being with us. I, I'm sure the students have really learned a lot and um, we'll, we'll generate a lot of discussion. Awesome. Awesome. Have a wonderful yeah. evening, everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Bye. Bye.